Hello, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. Welcome to our attempt to create a kind of informal hangout with our distinguished guest. Uh, before I introduce her, let me explain who I am, because there are a few of you I haven't met before. My name is Ed Finn, and I'm the director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. Um, and I will talk a bit more about that. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge and pay respects to the Akimelo Odom, Yavapai, Pipash, and other indigenous nations and peoples that have inhabited this land that we're on in Arizona for centuries. Their care, keeping, and imagination of these lands allow us to be here today. Uh, and so uh, we're very uh, thankful that we get to share some, some space and some time with all of you and with Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, so uh, the Center for Science of the Imagination has a mission of inspiring collective imagination for better futures. And I discovered Adrienne's work through <clears throat> emergent strategy and realized that this was somebody who was thinking about a lot of the same things that we think about, uh, imagination as uh, a, an invitation, as something that we do together, um, and that imagination and science fiction and stories that we tell about the future are a kind of toolkit, a set of practices that we use to make the world and try to make the world a better place. Um, and so I'm really excited and looking forward to, to hearing uh, uh, your thoughts about, uh, about all of that today, Adrian. Um, and uh, I'm so grateful that we get to spend a little time with you um, as part of in this sort of uh, smaller group setting. And thank you, thankful to all of you for coming to hang out with us as well. So Adrian Marie Brown is the writer in residence at the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute and author of We Will Not Cancel Us and Other Dreams of Transformative Justice. Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, and the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements and How to Get Stupid White Men Out of Office. She is a co-host of How to Survive the End of the World and Octavia's Parables Podcasts. Adrian is rooted in Detroit. Um, and so as part of one boat in the flotilla of different groups and entities at ASU that is like coming out of the, of the Zoom space harbor and welcoming you across this, this dark, dark sea of, of tiny rectangles. Thank you so much for joining us today, Adrian. Um, thank you for having me. It's, it's great, to, great to see you and thank you all again. So um, I want to uh, start with um, that little uh, comment I made at the beginning, and I'm happy to you know, tell you more about stuff that, that we do at CSI, but I just love to hear you reflect a little bit on um, imagination and science fiction as tools to change the world. I've got like more of your books keep piling up around my house. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I, I uh, it makes me very happy uh, to, and I feel like uh, there's a lot of complementarity in the, the way that it's see, I, from my perception from having, you know, read some of your work uh, in terms of how you're thinking about some of these issues and, and what you're doing, but yeah, what, what do you, what, what, what do, what does imagination mean to you? Maybe that's a good place to start. Yeah. I mean, I, I deeply believe that there is a connection between the world as we see it and what was imagined, right? Like that everything we are living inside of and things we take for granted and constructs around race and gender and all of these things were imagined. Someone imagined them and, that imagination can be a really beautiful, positive thing, you know, imagining community, imagining innovations, imagining going to space, imagining, um, you know, traveling um, in certain ways, imagining um, community that is diverse, that is multidimensional. And then there can be imagination that is, is not so beautiful. <laughs> you know, um, I think the imagination of superiority you know, is a lot of why we're in the circumstances we're in is that there's some people who imagined like, well, what if I was superior to everyone else? <laughs> um, and hijinks ensue for centuries. So I think imagine is, imagination is, is this fundamental piece of how the world gets shaped. And then we're in an interesting moment where it's very easy to dismiss imagination as being so important. Like, uh, it's like, oh, imagination, that's for the movies, that's for entertainment and not acknowledging, you know, one of the examples I often use is that 
Um, we, we currently, right now today, live in a world where a police officer can shoot an unarmed young Black person and then in court can defend themselves because they can say, in my imagination, I was in danger. Like, I'm like, that's serious. Like, imagination is actually a really, really serious thing. So if it's that serious, how do we take it that seriously? How do we hone it as a muscle? How do we work it? How do we practice it? And a lot of the work that I've been engaged in has been trying to come at it from a lot of different angles. You know, like, how do we imagine, like, straight up, how do we do visionary fiction and radical imagination work? Oh, that's right. How do we imagine ourselves as nature? How do we imagine our pleasure being something we all have access to? Um, and right now, it's how do we imagine abolition? How do we imagine ourselves practicing abolition? So, um, yeah, it's it's it feels like a fundamental piece to me of of what needs to happen in the world. There's so much of what you just said that resonates with things we've been talking about and, and doing, uh, trying to do. Uh, in our <clears throat> little corner of the world, yeah, uh, you know, I think that that idea, imagination, is so powerful, and we all spend so much energy imagining things, and often imagining things that you know we we, we didn't really choose because it takes a, a huge amount of energy to imagine and give power to these structures that can be so oppressive and destructive, you know, yeah. uh, that we 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 all collectively are doing this work, right, and we have. To we, we uh, I think so much of the imagination work that we do collectively is invisible and unacknowledged. And yes. we're sort of ruled by it instead of finding ways to, to take, take more charge and be, you know, feel a sense of agency and responsibility and empower our own imaginations and try to imagine things for the better instead of being ruled right. by our fears and our anxieties. Um, so uh, a, few, a few paths I wanna, Go down here, but one of them is is you know you mentioned radical imagination, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned science fiction. Octavia Butler is sort of a you know like in the background here. She's in the air. Um, could you talk a little bit about how storytelling is is a part of this, and maybe you know uh, and and I want to get to um, sort of methods and practices more generally. So if there's some other yeah yeah you want to bring in that would be great too. Um, yeah, I mean I. I... I still thrill every time I hear her name, <laughs> you know, like I have such a, um, a deep, like scholarly love ship of Octavia. Um, and I think one of the things she taught us about storytelling is it's both the most ancient collective practice we have, right? Is that we, as soon as we sort of came into community, it started to be like, oh, what is the story of all that exists? What is our story of the sun and the moon and the stars and, and the cycles of life? And we, those stories were so important that they, we built our, our religions around them, whole divinity practices around them that get uplifted today. You know, it's like, is this truth? Is this myth? It, I don't know, but this is the story. These are all the stories of, of how we got here. And then there's the story of what's to come and, um, and who gets to write the story. And so much of the work that I've been up to is trying to give more people permission to see themselves as they are holding, everyone's holding part of the story, um, which is interesting. You know, it's an interesting challenge as a writer, because as a writer, I'm like, I go off into the woods and I write a story by myself that occurs just to me. And I try to return to the world and, and be like, a story is something original. Um, and it's not that there's, it's not original, but it's concurrently original and there's nothing new under the sun, as Octavia said, like the stories have been told and we tend to sell the same stories over and over. Um, I have been in a practice and we'll see if I can achieve this in my lifetime, but I'm trying, practicing, that most of our stories are built around a core conflict. So it's like, you know, we were living and then this thing happened to us and we had to fight back against it. And there was a hero and then like, you know, but the conflict is at the center. And I've been like, what would it look like to displace conflict from the center of the story and have pleasure be at the center of the story um, or awakening, like an awakening that wasn't sparked by harm or fear or danger, but an awakening that was sparked by an invitation. And so I keep, I keep trying to figure out like at a very small scale, like how, how do we change how we think of story and how we build story. Um, 
and then, you know, you spoke to this, but in the wake of Octavius Brood coming out, which was the book that I put out with, uh, with Walida Imarisha, we did, yes, that one. I was like, I know it's in your house, Ed. Um, you know, but we went and did this tour where we were just doing sci-fi writing workshops. And so we were doing collective storytelling processes. And it was so titillating to see how tender and vulnerable and excited people were to just be given permission to hold part of the story. To be like, I, I'm not just a character in someone else's story, which, you know, for me, like as a black person in the US, I'm like, I was, I, my ancestors were brought here to be a character in someone else's story, a minor character, um, a nameless character, a, you know, three fifths of a character, not even a whole character. And, and so to the act, I mean, it's such a sacred act to then be like, I am reclaiming that I, as much as anyone else, no more or no less, I have a story that is an important part of what, what comes. I also think the stories we imagine and who, like how many people we have at the table being like, we're telling the story together, shapes what then comes. And I think about this a lot with disability justice. This is a big one where it's like, you know, architecture is really creating a story of the future of a place, right? Like we're gonna, we have a story of a building and what's gonna happen in this building and who's gonna be here and how we're gonna use it. But if disabled people aren't in the room when that story is being cast and collectively imagined, then we end up with a building that doesn't have any ramps or wide bathroom doors or anywhere for people to come sit or whatever, you know, it's like, so I'm like, oh, we didn't have enough people together to ideate the story. And that becomes now what I'm in a constant practice of is how do we get enough people with enough divergent ways of being together to start to tell the story of what, what we want to come that's not just it being in someone else's matrix, surviving in someone else's dream, right? I'm like, wake up. Let's wake ourselves up from the dream that did not include us in a significant way and then begin to co-dream, co-imagine, co-build a, a story where not just we exist, but we can see that seven generations, that indigenous worldview, right? We can really see our, our, our progeny, our babies, our, you know, the, and our earth. Like that's the other thing is, this has been really humbling lately. And I'm like, oh, the earth has a story. The earth has a million stories too. In Iceland, the earth is telling a story of release right now, this massive volcano that's just like, I'm shaking everything up again. And I'm like, yeah, that volcano speaks for me. That volcano speaks for me. It's telling a story that feel, I feel that volcano story. Um, so, you know, I'm just like, oh, I want to partner with the stories of humans, I also want to be partnering. I mean, how do I partner with the stories of those who I may not, they don't, they didn't learn English, they didn't get colonized yet, but they also have stories to tell. It's, again, so much that you said that that uh, really connects with me. And I think the the things that we're we're all doing uh, at CSI, you know, that uh, first of all, that sense of giving people permission and uh, agency um, to talk about the future and also to, to be hopeful and optimistic, right? Yeah. Which also, because there's so much fear and, uh, and it, it's often scarier to put yourself out there and say, well, here's something that I think would be good. You know, here's something we wanna to work towards. And that, that fundamental spirit of, of optimism is something else that has motivated us from the beginning not that it's all going to be great, you know, and that everything's fine or that some nice people in white lab coats or in Silicon Valley are going to like, you know, fix it all. Um, but that doing the work, imagining different futures and exploring the possibility space is, is how we start to get there, you know, that we can make yeah. the future better by working on it, imagining it today. Yeah. Um, and I just to echo what you said, I think the, the big the, the major crisis we face right now as a species is that uh, we're too few people are in charge of imagining the future or feel That's like right. they have permission to imagine the future. That's we right. have to get much more inclusive uh, if we're going to survive baseline goal, yeah. but you know, yeah. to reach beyond that and to thrive and to create that beautiful world that we want, 
Um, I, and I guess I want to I want to talk about um, uh, uh, joy and, and, and beauty and pleasure, uh, but I want to first talk about the the work, which I guess is also you know they're connected. But so you know maybe you could talk a little bit about um, uh, methods. You you use the word facilitation a lot. You know, mm-hmm. sort of a core practice. I think um, you know how do you uh, inspire collective imagination? How do you do mm-hmm. the work? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's very fascinating for me is I've been leaning, so I've spent the last like basically 25 years facilitating social justice work. And by that meaning, you know, my role was to hold space, hold space for change to happen. And, um, and really to, to try to make it easy. It's like being a human is hard being a human with another human or more is hard um, because our experiences are so divergent. Like as a species, and it's one of the things that's the most interesting to me, like looking at the natural world that, you know, sometimes I wonder, and again, this might be human arrogance, but I'm like, it seems like as a species, we have the most special diversity of experiences. You know, that most species, if you look at it, you're like, oh, flamingos. You're a flamingo, you have a fairly common experience oak trees. This is your experience, you know, uh, but humans have wildly divergent experiences of what, what it is to human. Um, and so, so to facilitate is to be like from wildly different experiences, how do we find a common thread? How can I make it easier to hear where there is alignment and, and to turn and face the places where there is divergence and see if it can become generative rather than disruptive or the end of the road. And I, I love the method of facilitation and um, I will admit, you know, I can, my confession is like it came, it just, that was what I was called to do. Like I didn't train, I didn't, you know, no one told me that there was even a thing called this. It was just like, this is what I do when I show up in a space. And I think um, that in every hundred people or so, there's a handful who share that call or that impetus of like, oh, when I get into a group, I see the whole. When I get into a group, I see the pattern, you know? Um, and so I think those people become teachers, become facilitators, become mediators, become um, leaders sometimes. I wish more of them became leaders and politicians and stuff like that, because I'm like, it's so rare that you see a facilitative politician, right? I think this is part of why Obama, as many critiques as I had of different policy pieces, it, he he resonated with me because I was like, he's a facilitative leader and you can see that in how he moves. Um, so that method is, has been a major one for me. And I'm excited because today, my next book just went up for pre-order today. It's called Holding Change, The Way of Emergent Strategy Facilitation and Mediation. And it's kind of like a, like Dao De Ching is what I had in mind. I was like, how do I make these brief, pieces of, of wisdom offerings of like, here's what I figured out about facilitation that I know works or I know is true. I understand, you know, it's like this can, you can hold this and work with this. Um, so that method has been really important to me. Facilitation as a method led me to the method of mediation, right? So that what kept happening is I would be holding a group and then something would arise that was, um, systemic pressures playing out as interpersonal dynamics. And so it'd be like, okay, what do we do with this? Um, Cause it's not just like this guy's an asshole and you know, whatever. It's like, he's embodying patriarchy in this moment and white supremacy. And she's embodying years of intergenerational trauma that makes her think that she can't speak up. And they're in this interaction where now she's found her voice and he's not ready to hear it. That's what's actually happening. How do I hold up room for them to both be in their humanity with all the power dynamics and all the stuff that's going on? And so I developed a method that I call kitchen table mediation. So I was like, I need to be able to do this anywhere because it never, it's never planned. <laughs> now it's starting to be a little bit more planned, but at the time it was like, it's never planned. It's never like, we need help. You know, it's always like we're in the meeting and it's grinding and everything is coming to a stop. Um, so the mediation method came in there. And then the last piece for the ideation specifically was invitation. 
So I've been really honing the practice of like, how do I ask questions that generate um, not just one answer, but many answers? And then how do I let people know like many answers can coexist in a healthy ecosystem, right? This is the science of things in a healthy ecosystem. The, the diversity, the biodiversity is how you know it's healthy because so many different things are able to coexist and they're not expected to try to become one thing. So, you know, I talk about this all the time with organizers because I'm like, y'all are trying to make everyone be an oak tree, but you need the oak trees and you need the mycelium and you need the sparrows and you need bees, but you also need flowers. And I was like, you have to be in a system where there can be symbiosis where there can be dynamic relationship and where when something's ready to die, that other things are ready to make life from that. Like you need all of that fecundity and that, that abundance. Um, so for me getting in a space and being like, yes. And, you know, that theater practice, that improv, you know, yes. And yes, and yes. And, and, and how do you at least hold room for enough of that to unfold that people can then be like, okay, from all this, yes. And, here's something that thrills all of us. Because I think what has happened, in, especially amongst people who are like, we're the losers or we're, we're not in the winning position is that we, we brainstorm, but then we generate, we land on the lowest common denominator and the thing that's least likely to ruffle the feathers or actually per perturb the surface. And, but what we need is a thing that's gonna like drain the pond, right? We need something that's like, we gotta get, this whole thing's gotta go. So I'm like, how do we start to ideate enough that we find that idea that enlivens all of us, that makes all of us like, oh, that's it. And I can see my place in it. And in Detroit, we, we did these beautiful processes where we are like, what needs our imagination medicine here? What issues need our, the medicine of our imagination? And it was like, clearly the water crisis, clearly the heat and housing crisis. Every winter, homeless people are, are put out of their homes but then they also shut off the heat for people who aren't paying those bills. You can't do that with how cold it gets here. Even as climate is changing, it's still we still have at least one month of real cold. Uh, so stuff like that was like, so starting to ask communities, every community actually can answer this. If y'all, if we were doing a workshop right now, and I was like, what, what do y'all, where do you know inside of your community that imagination is needed? You would have those answers. And that also helps. It's like every community knows they know what they need. They know what they need. They may not know how to get it, you know, what, what to shift in order to practice something new, but they have a sense of like, well, here's the problem. And if there's a problem, there's a, a, there's, that's the invitation into imagination. That's uh, really beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think that idea of uh, cultivating, inviting people into imagining for themselves, right, rather yeah. than just sort of pitching or selling a story that, you know, is, is the one size fits all or somebody else yeah. came up with I, is I think that the most important work, but it, it's also really hard. Uh, and I love the way you talked about um, how to, how important it is to hold space for everybody who has their own context and situations and how so often we become microcosms of these much bigger forces, right? And often unwittingly. And, you know, we're, we're already tired because we spent so much time, you know, supporting that that big castle floating in the air right with yes. our own imaginations um and i guess i i think uh you know we 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 do some things like this but we tend to do it in, in a smaller in, environments and we have you know we're, we're work, asking people to work together on coming up with some kind of a vision for the future um yeah i love smaller environments yeah yeah but i think it uh you know we've started to think about how we expand and instead of bringing people to us, how we find communities where they are and help yes. communities, you know, start to um, uh, imagine uh, or how we can help, how we can facilitate um, some of that work. Um, yeah. Maybe, I think you've, you've talked about this a little bit, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on this idea of resilience. You know, I think about imagination as this kind of ignition system for all this other mm -hmm. stuff that we know we really care about, like empathy yeah. and foresight and and yeah. uh, and resilience, um, but we don't like we don't see it. You know, we don't see the imagination part of it. We just see the the outputs or the symptoms when it goes missing. 
Um, so is that is that oh you know I, I, you, you you I love the way you bring in complexity and, and emergence uh, in in emergent strategy. Um, is is resilience a word that you think about a lot? Is that something you know like the idea that it's yeah. not just showing up and facilitating, but how do you create things that persist on their own? Yeah, I think of resilience a lot and in in a lot of ways too. You know, um, I. I will be honest, the first time I heard the term resilience like applied to community, I was very wary of it because I was in Detroit and it was like, y'all are so resilient. And I was like, it, that the way that it's like, oh, you're so resilient, we can continue to abuse the community because you're fine. <laughs> you'll, you'll bounce back or you just somehow magic Negro, you always make it, I don't know. And, and that feeling of like, no, that's not what we mean. That's not what we want to cultivate in ourselves. Um, and I study somatics. I've studied somatics for the last 10 years. So in the body, resilience is that capacity to recover from harm. And imagination is one of the first things we do to recover from harm. It, it's one of the ways we know that recovery is happening because we, are no, we start to be like, oh, I'm not just stuck in the trauma story. The trauma story, it, at some level, the trauma story says I'm unlovable. Right, like fundamentally, if you root all the way down into almost every trauma story, some part of it says I'm not lovable, and the imagination starts to say, I am lovable. Maybe I could love myself. Perhaps my community could love me. You know, like you know, all the little things, and we there could be a relationship of of love between the people in a community, between the community and the earth. It could be a love that is wide enough to hold the fact that trauma was there, is there right? That we live inside of that. And uh, when you're in a community that, that feels they cannot imagine, usually it's because the trauma is still present and still happening. So when you're, you know, like we have, we've been through a couple of rounds of this in Detroit now where, especially certain zip codes, where they're being bombarded by so many multitudinous crises concurrently, that when you start to ask people, like, well, what do y'all want? We want this to stop. That's as far as we can think. We want this harm to stop. And I think that is happening right now on the largest scale that we have understand. I think the Me Too movement is, is that. It's like, we would like room to imagine and we can't even get there because we just need a name like that this harm is happening all the time and it's too much. And I think Black Lives Matter is, is from that place. Like, saying our lives matter is the minimum thing we should be imagining together. <laughs> and we have to fight for that, right? So there's these places where it's like, how do we help people come to the place of, ah, oh, that trauma is there and you have the right to imagine beyond it. And practicing, strengthening that muscle, that is your resilience. That's how you will recover from this harm is that you will start to imagine a life beyond this harm and put the harm in that rear view mirror, put the harm as a scar. And, you know, I think about this on the grandest scale right now. One of my visions, my radical imagination is that capitalism becomes a scar, not a present activity, that patriarchy becomes a scar, that we imagine cooperative economics, that we imagine right relationship with the planet, that we imagine um, consent-based sensual culture, that we imagine these things that, that were, it's like, we went through that as a species. We did go through that. It was hard. We nearly eliminated some of our people that we deeply needed. That was awful. And here's how we are imagining ourselves back into a species, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, so much of what you're saying it, it, Resonates again. I keep saying that over and over again. So, <laughs> well, because we're doing that. I mean, like science and imagination. Like we're in. We're floating in the water together. Like, whoop, yeah, yeah. Totally. I love you. I love you too. You know, like we're, <laughs> we're in there. You know. Right there. Uh, mm. And I want to say, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you one more question or one more clump, okay. one tangled clump of, of like four questions. Um, and, and <laughs> then so I at want, least you're owning it. Own yeah, it. No, I'm. That's 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 kind of you know. It's a choose your own adventure kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I want to let everybody know that I see a couple of great questions in chat already, but 
start thinking about what you'd like to bring to the conversation. We can open this up. Um, so uh, responding to so many of the things you just said, uh, yes, you know, there's so many more ways we could imagine our lives, right? That yes. part about these pyramid schemes and, you know, living in a, a, a sort of an economy of, of wanting and, and needing and fearing and, you know, yeah. uh, uh, lacking, uh, which is so much of the way that we've organized our world right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to connect this to uh, the future because I think one of the, the, other fundamental things we have to do is find that sense of, of joy and optimism and hope, right? And even the, this is, you know, maybe a, a weird thing to say, but to, to sort of find the, the, the pleasure even in our scarves, right? To say the things we've moved through um, yes. and, and connecting history in the future, the past in the future um, as, as uh, you know, the, the only way we can um, we can escape the present. And one of the weird things that I, I see is that we're, we've, we've really made a kind of prison out of the present moment and you can't yes. escape either way. Yes. Uh, and that's one of the, you know, the, the powerful kinds of imagination that we need to, um, to, to foster, to kindle. So yeah. I, can you talk a little bit about sort of that, that idea of, and I don't know if, you know, pleasure, joy, um, you know, optimism, hope, these aren't all the same, but you know, how you think about um, that, because that I think is the, the, the only way we can really in, inspire broad changes to, is to sh show people that's something that they want, right? That mm -hmm. it's not something that you should do or that you have to do, but it's yeah. something that we want because it's, it's gonna make us feel better. Yeah, I like this. Um, yeah, you know, I think there's there's components like the ideas weave around each other. Um, the place where I keep coming back to, like the kind of irresistible place that keeps drawing me back is this question of satisfiability. Like what is it you long for, which is often rooted in where you feel unsatisfied currently, right? And what would it feel like to feel satisfaction? You know, do you know when it happens? And then what would it feel like to feel collective satisfaction? Which, I, you know, I'm always thinking at the fractal level, I'm like, if we don't have a pattern of individual satisfaction of any practice where we know like, this is satisfying, that was enough. <laughs> then I don't know how we would do that at a collective level. Um, and I think we make this mistake often is we're like, we need to defund the prisons. And I'm like, but you still punish everyone you get angry at. So we need to stop that punishment practice. So that, right. All, that, that, that becomes a viable strategy. Cause I'm like, don't defund the prison so that you can just keep punishing, 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 you know, that we free for all punish. Uh, you know, I'm like, how do we, how do we unlearn the behavior at the root system? Or we need a functional democracy. I'm like, you have not shared a decision-making process with anyone ever, <laughs> you, you know, even in your family you're constantly manipulating the game or like someone's in control of the budget or whatever. How do you practice shared decision-making, collaborating about budget, collaborating about resource. So you know, I think about pleasure that same way that I'm like, well, if if we have been trained to think that satisfaction is not even possible, then how do we first flip that switch on? It's like, I could be satisfied. And right now I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to accumulate days where I feel that satisfaction each day, inside of each day. And I feel the satisfaction inside of multiple relationships, right? And, and it means I have to be really mindful. Like this is my current mindfulness practice is that when it happens, I'm like, oh, yes, this is it. I, I, I was told what love would be like. I tried all these different experiments, but now I'm in love. And this is satisfying. I feel met. Um, you know, I was told I could never keep plants alive but I taught myself how to be present with plants and I got bulbs and globes and I started singing to them. And now I'm in a room surrounded by plants. Like that's very satisfying to me. And just noticing it at the scale of like, oh, this, this, in this moment right now, this is enough, you know, this is enough. Um, and then letting whatever the next need is arise from that place. Like, oh, I'm actually really quite resourced, but now I'm hungry right? Because it's also always changing, you know? And I think that's what it's like, how do we practice that at a community level where it's like, I have never felt community satisfied by our justice process ever. 
because we either have the option of there were no charges and there's no accountability or this person's going to prison, which we know doesn't work. And we have a 250 years of that experiment failing and not ending harm. So there's no satisfying option inside of the current justice scenario. And so for me, that's where I'm like, I wanna learn how we bring that sense, that felt sense of satisfaction to each of these things. And I said something recently, I was on this podcast um, called Politically Reactive. And I was like, I don't want a fake orgasm of a climate policy. And it keeps coming back to me that I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. This is what I'm saying. It's like, it ties together. I don't want the fake orgasm version of all these justice things that actually need to be real. Like we really need to have the total surrender, total presence, total yes, so that we can move forward in, in life and be in an authentic relationship with the world. And, and then I think, who benefits from the fake orgasm? Who benefits from the dissatisfaction, the unspoken dissatisfaction? The current systems that exist, right? Mm -hmm. They're so terrified of the wound that'll come from not being, you know, like if you tell them, oh, yeah, I faked that orgasm, then it's a wound to their system. Oh, What's wrong with my penis or whatever happens inside you know it's like that it's like oh it's not about wounding your ego it's about we need to collaborate together we need to communicate together we need to be more present we need, so much needs to happen so that we can both be here in that so that is also the piece where i'm interested about the scarification because i think the idea needs to become a scar but all the people who are participating in it they're also the wounded you know people who think that that they are supreme because they are white they are trying to avoid the wound of not being supreme. That, that They're like, that's gonna hurt so much. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, it's actually okay. And so I've lived my whole life not thinking I was supreme to anyone and I'm fine, it's, it's good. <laughs> I'm satisfied, my life feels great because I'm not trying to uphold a myth. I'm not trying to like sustain a lie and puff myself out and project something that's not true. I'm just like, no, I'm a human being. I'm good at some stuff. I can't speak any languages. I'm a human, it's fine. So I feel like there's that piece of like, it's like we kind of have to, I'm trying to think of the metaphor for it, you know, it's like, how do we actually pull the toxin out of the wound so that it can scar? Maybe that's it. It's like all these participants are like, you're, you're I'm like, by participating, you're the toxic little thing in there. You had to pull that out. And Octavia has this brilliant thing in Lilith's Brood where cancer is the, the thing that these aliens are interested in. These aliens come to earth and they they gather stuff from different species. And they're like, the most valuable thing humans have is cancer. When I first read this, I was I had a, a friend dying from cancer. So I was like, fuck, Octavia, you're fucking with me. Like, but I was like, there's something so brilliant about even things we think of as toxic are mostly just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. They're not where they can actually serve. They're not where they can mm, be in their light. So I'm like, I'm curious, what would it look like for white men to be in their light, <laughs> right? What would it look like for um, for racists? Like, I'm like, what, is there a light in there? Like, what, what is it? Is there is there some deep longing for belonging that, you know, like what what's in there? And I think all of it is like, if you let that scar, you could actually belong. <laughs> and belonging, I think is like one of the most fundamental things that all humans want. Um, and so we're trying, I, I said this to the group earlier, but I'm really in this exploration right now of like belonging um, as it relates to identity versus community mm -hmm. and how we keep collapsing those. So we're like, oh, my identity is my community. And I'm like, no, your identity is your identity. And community is a chosen place where you work with people to, to co-create belonging. And I think this is what, you know, I think if you look at the majority of people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, it's people who've mistaken and collapsed identity and community looking for belonging. And now they're just in jail because, you know, or whatever. Um, so it's like, oh, that didn't work, but, you know, will they adapt? So yeah, I think that's something we, we're really uh, wrestling with is how to uh, be together, yeah. be, be individuals together and disagree about some things, but have you know, honest communication and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the internet does not seem to have helped. Um, but I, I just want to say, you know, I, I think sometimes I just echo you again, you know, saying this is enough is the most radical thing you can say sometimes, right? Finding mm -hmm. the way to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that's- It has to really be enough. 
Yeah, right. That's right. It's not about uh, <laughs> just yeah. Uh, not. I was like, I learned that you know from my mom that I was like, you said that, but you didn't mean it. And I can sense <laughs> your resentment, and that resentment is not. That's not enough. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, no. Th- thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but to f- find the way to you know identify the things that are enough. Yeah. And the own like to 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 own those and cherish those. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, pause here and open this up. So if you'd like to raise your, your hand, um, that would be great. I already have a couple of uh, uh, questions here. So maybe uh, Justine, uh, raise your hand and then Lisa, we'll go to you next with your question that you would put in the chat. Um, hello. Please, Hi, I, Justine. I, I didn't say this, please introduce yourself quickly. And then, yeah, go yeah um, this is really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, my name is Justine. I am a graduate student at ASU in the Justice Studies program, but I'm also here with Mutual Aid Phoenix. Yay! And also representing a group that I worked with, uh, Humanities Behind the Walls, where we taught um, we taught classes at a women's prison here. And awesome. I wanted to share with you, and I do have a question, uh, very brief, um, that both Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and uh, your book, Emergent Strategy, we read inside and deeply Thank informed you. so much what we did. We were able to do like a play with Vicki Law, do poetry readings, Aww, and, organize <laughs> and it was wonderful. So thank you for, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, and thank so, you, that means a lot to me. Yeah, your work meant a lot to us too. So thank, thank you, you, sorry, I'm like, Bleh. but. <laughs> we're gonna do it together, honey. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So um, I guess the question I have, and I think you kind of talked about this in all the questions that were asked, but I kind of want to try to bring it together a little bit, is that the role imagination plays in our movements. Yeah. Um, Because I think there are multiple imaginations within our movements and some leave us down one path and some lead us down another. That's right. Paths are messy. So I'm wondering what, how you would would think of that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think, one of the things we talked about with Octavia's Brood was all organizing is science fictional behavior. Like we're trying to imagine a world we've never experienced, um, a world without prisons. You know, one of the things that's like, we've never actually known that, but we feel in our hearts that it's possible. And I think what happens is in some places it's like we imagine, like if we need to imagine beyond the horizon, but we only imagine to the horizon. I think that's what happens sometimes. So it's like, we're imagining, it's like, yes, we're trying to do justice work, whatever, but we don't actually imagine beyond the like imbalance of power. So those organizers end up in what I think of as the power over organizing model, where it's like these poor people in this community, they don't know anything. I'm gonna come tell them things and convince them to care about you know life because they don't even know to care about life and I'm gonna organize them, right? And so you see that, and it's, I mean, it's well-intentioned, right? It's like, we gotta free these people's minds, you know? But when I've been in community, I've never been in a community where people are like, cluelessly living, you know, like, it's like, if people don't know, it's because they're under so many pressures. And what you need to do is not try to then become another pressure, trying to change their mind, but you need to relieve the pressure. <laughs> right, relieve some pressure. And so that's why I loved, um, and I was, re- I was referencing this um, with a friend the other day. Oh, I was talking about this my, my, with Toshi. We were talking about this on the uh, Octavius Parables podcast about the Black Panther Breakfast Program and how it relieves this pressure. And now like so many schools have breakfast program. It's like just an assumed thing in, in most schools now that there is one of the reasons why COVID was so daunting for so, so many communities because they're like, the breakfast program, it might be the most important thing that's happening for these kids in breakfast and lunch, um, regardless of what they're learning. So something like that, where it's like relieving the pressure of hunger in a community, then allows something different for the kids. It allows something different for the parents. It allows something different for the whole. And I think about how often we're not willing to do that humble work of relieving a pressure because we're like, our ego is tied up in doing this ideological work of like, we've got to change the mind. And uh, Detroit really humbled me around that. Detroit really humbled me around that because you try to come tell anybody in Detroit anything about what they need to think of, they're like, get out of our faces. We don't even trust y'all organizers, like whatever. 
And meanwhile, all of them are organizers in the way that I would think, you know, like I was trained in New York and California. I'm like, all the people making change in Detroit are folks I would think of as organizers. And they're like, this is just being in a community and being responsible for your community and caring about it. And that, that for me was a total like, right. And the big lesson was if people's trash is not getting picked up, focus on helping their trash get picked up. If people's heat is not on, focus on getting the heat turned on. If you attend to those material needs with community, they'll figure out the ideas, <laughs> right? They will, they will find, and then feed them books, right? Feed people books. Like that's why I write. Cause I'm like, okay, I can't reach everyone. I can't talk to everyone, but I, I want to help people have a language for what they are doing. And, you know, emergency strategy is happening. It's been happening since the beginning of time. I didn't make it up. I saw it happening. And for communities to have a common language across different gender background, whatever, to be able to say, oh, like we are adapting together. You know, I don't have to teach them to do that. It's already happening. It's just like, can you notice that this thing you're doing is valuable and you could be better at that thing if you valued it, you know? So, yeah. I see uh, Lisa and Damien. Yeah, sorry, Justine, did you did I catch you yeah. up? Okay. Ed, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lisa K. Solomon, and I am a designer in residence futurist at the Stanford New School, where I spend a lot of time bridging futures thinking, design thinking, and starting really with humans uh, and, and allowing them to be their best selves, to imagine uh, their preferred collective futures. And I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, when I read your book, I just felt like I was home listening to you speak. I feel like I'm even more at home and there's just something absolutely beautiful in how you present these ideas. And my, um, and I appreciate you, ch you uh, chatting with me. It was more of not even so much my question as opposed to playing back what I heard. And uh, uh, what, I, what I'm just resonating so much with is the intentional language uh, that both you and Adrian, you are using to get people into a place of leaning in versus leaning out. And um, you spoke of throughout your talk, a lot of tensions, tensions of the past yeah. and the future tensions of trauma and love. And, and I guess the biggest tension I see and would love, and I'm so excited for your new book, is this work requires people to slow down in order to speed up. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you get people. And listen, I'm calling in from the heart of Silicon Valley. Like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, fun, it's <laughs> the exponential, right? And I'm at the point, and I'm always like, can we, can we, can we just slow down, right? I promise right that going slow will help us go fast. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you invite people into a slower way of noticing, of using intentional language, of getting yeah. them to join you for a journey um, that is emergent in and of its nature. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, one thing, you know, in my ideal world, I would model that. It hasn't happened yet. I'm still very much, you know, um, I'm trying all the time to be like, slow down, girl. Like, I'm slowing my life down. You know, I am like, I'm trying to be an embodiment. I have a little tattoo of a turtle. I think it's over here somewhere. And I have a pet turtle now. And my turtle is a really helpful teacher. And we have an Instagram account for our turtle. Because every day I watch this turtle walk around. And, and they just like move at exactly the pace that they move at. And when something scares them, they're like, let me stop. And I'm going to slowly take in all the information before I make a decision to do anything else. And it's such a good teacher for me. I'm so used to like make the decision in midair, make the decision before you land, whatever it is. Um, so at an individual level, I'm like, how do I slow down? And when I'm facilitating or when I'm holding space in a room, if I can slow down, the room will slow down because that that's the, you know, that's what I'm embodying. That's what I'm inviting them to is like, let's take a breath together here. Let's notice that sometimes uh, a lot of emotion will be popping up and you can feel an emotion pop up and get truncated. You know, it's like, because someone else jumps in. And so just pause and hold on. Wow. It feels like that person just, did you just, apologize to this room for something that happened in here. I want to make sure we notice that, right? So slowing down at that level, like asking people to be there with you. And then when I'm talking to groups, um, trying to convince them to slow down, to like, trust me, to let things move a little slower. The main thing I talk about is trust, right? That I'm like, 
you all say you want to trust each other. And I promise you, as a Virgo, I promise you, you will be more efficient if you trust each other. You will get so much more done if you trust each other. But you're going to have to slow down to get there. Just like in a romantic relationship, because all relationships are relationships, right? Like some of them have dynamics of sensuality or eros or forgiver, raising kids, but they're all relationships. Even in the work realm, they're relationships. So at the beginning, the trust is slow because you're, you're literally strangers to each other. But the more you learn and understand, oh, this person has a whole tale that has nothing to do with me, that's their own sovereign experience. And I have my own sovereign experience. And what we're doing is dancing between those. Then you learn like, oh, I can trust that this person is going to show up from their experience and I'm going to show up from mine. And as opposed to how we get, I think, socialized, which is don't trust until someone earns it. And the minute they do something, they're trying to harm you. Don't trust them, right? It's like, no, literally no one's thinking about you that much. You know, even when now, like the internet, if someone literally comes straight at me with harmful behavior on the internet, I understand that is not actually about me, right? If I can trust that that person has a wound, I can examine, do I have anything to do with that wound, right? Do I have anything to do with that wound? How can I trust that this dynamic is not what it appears to be necessarily? And that takes time and it's very slow at first, but then when you see groups who trust each other, whether it's a group of two or a family unit or an organization, it's mind blowing how quickly things can move. And Silicon Valley is a trick because People try to leap straight to the fast and often move very quickly because there's a fake trust, like a surface level trust, because it's like, I trust you to have smart ideas. Like smart people, once you recognize someone else is smart, you're like, I trust you to be smart with me. Like I've made that, I've done that before. I'm like, oh, we could get a lot done. But I'm like, oh wait, I didn't know you were also evil. <laughs> you know, I didn't know you were actually, or you know, capitalist or whatever it is. You know, I'm like, actually, I didn't know there was this massive values difference that means that you're using your intelligence differently than how I'm using it. And then you have a trust breakdown and whether you can recover is like, are you willing to slow down and find values alignment, right? Um, so when I talk to groups about trust, that's usually the moment where they're like, oh, like, and it'll help us work better. Now, I think something that has been helpful is, you know, cause, cause there's like, you have the idea of it. I had the idea of this. I've seen it work at small scales, you know, with different organizations and formations. But now it's like I was able to get, I was able to facilitate the movement for Black Lives and at a moment of crisis, get them to slow down, focus on trust, weave a much deeper uh, web with each other. And now they're moving federal policy and they're launching off new organizations. And so much is happening that is tangible material outcome because they trust each other enough to allow everyone to play their position, right? And the same thing is happening with other very large formations that I got to support. And so I'm like, oh, I have case studies. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I've got, I've, got, I've got receipts. Like it really does work at it, it scales. And trust is something that's like, the, the internet and trust are like in a, in a big battle right now because the internet, everything is about moving fast and then faster, and it's not a place to slow down. So one of the things I've been really, really working with people on is like limit the amount of time you spend on the superhighway, right? Like it doesn't mean you don't have to, you can't be on there, but just really, really, you know, think of it as, as, as you're moving through your life. If you sprint all day, you will not be able to go far. You won't be able to go very many days if you sprint all day and the internet is sprinting right? Your mind, your heart, everything, your sense of reactivity, everything's sprinting. So sprint for 15 minutes. You know, right now that's my, that's my cap as I allow myself to sprint for 15 to 30 minutes a day. And then I'm off of there and I'm like, I'm in a marathon over here. I'm on a stroll over here. I'm laying on the couch playing Mario brothers, you know, different things are happening at different pace, but I can't, I know I will not survive and I will not have good ideas if I'm sprinting all day. Right. Thank you. Thank you for I that question. 
I see uh, Damien and Troy. I'm hoping we can get to both of their questions. So we might run a little bit past the hour just to- Okay, I'll be, I'll talk shorter too. Yeah, but it, I'll, you know, we're, we're fine with that. And, <laughs> um, I think we've, we've, we've it's, it uh, should be okay for your schedule because uh, we're, we're hanging out with you a little bit after this too, Adrian. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, just if anyone needs to drop off, of course, that's totally fine. So go ahead, Damien. Um, hi, I want to first thank you so much for the talk today and your time. I really, really appreciate it. And thank I find you. myself, uh, as previously stated, uh, in deep agreement and, and feeling uh, a sense of resonance uh, throughout so much of, of what you talked about and what you write about in general, obviously. But um, so thank, thank you. you for that. Um, I'm Damien. I am a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society. Cool. Um, my work is in how values get embedded into technology. I focus okay. on AI and human biotech interventions specifically. So, I like all the ways those things sound. Yeah. Yeah. They they work together in in weird ways, and you know Octavia Butler's work is obviously like embedded and crouched in all of those things. So yeah. like. Um, I really do. I appreciate everything there. Um, my question kind of gets back to something that you were talking about in terms of like values mismatch and yep. that overarching kind of like, how do we use this kind of crux of what you're talking about in terms of imagination as a communicative language to help us bridge those values mismatches when they show up, right? So yeah. like so much of the work that we all do uh, whether we are policy individuals, whether we are you know, writers, whether we are uh, researchers, or whether we are all of the above, as many of us are, um, the so much of that work is about trying to make legible these these different needs, these different stakes, these different yeah. drives, and these different values, right? And so, yeah. how do you, in your practice, and also in your intentions and your understandings? Uh, see the work of, of using imagination to make those those very sometimes very wide gulfs yes at the very least a little bit narrower <laughs> if not bridging them entirely yeah I like this question Damien and I think of imagination as a technology I think of it as an indigenous technology right so when I was working at the RECA Society I got to work with all these different indigenous communities who were doing the indigenous people's power project and they were, you know, I'd heard the idea of like, we have to th do things thinking seven generations ahead. I'd heard that, but then working with folks, I was like, oh, oh, like actually think through what's gonna happen in each of these generations and like what unfolds. And I was like, Whoa. and so if, if we use that technology with people, often that helps unveil the values differentials and what is actually, um, what is the move that, that, that works best in the longest view, right? So imagination is an invitation to be like, your idea is great if we only need to live one more generation or one more decade. It's a fucking brilliant idea. I love it. Everybody should have 5G technology embedded in their brain. Awesome. We'll have a great decade. But we're supposed to have babies from these bodies and they're supposed to have babies and they're supposed to have babies and they're supposed to have babies. And we don't know the impact, right? Like I went and got the vaccine and I was like, this goes against my, my imaginatory process because I can't foresee enough. And Octavia told me not to do this. And I still want to go see my family. <laughs> and, you know, so it was like one of those moments where I was like, oh, oh, I can feel myself pulled between the short view satisfaction and the long view responsibility. So I feel like imagination is what helps us dance. And often when I'm with people where I'm like, they're like having this clash, I really ask them to write out, tell me what unfolds. Don't argue with each other. Let your ideas talk to each other as they unfold over time. If your idea works right now, what is the longest perspective that you can see? And I, I, I try to be polite with you or, or kind or in, inviting, but I'm also like, the horizon is not far enough. You know, the horizon is what we can see right now. And as we move closer to it, it will keep moving further away. There's more territory beyond it. So you have to be able to be like, how can I go beyond what I, the limitation of what I can see right now in this imagining? 
I think Octavia did that really well. I think that's what she was up to. It's like, oh, like, even if I imagine, you know, for Lilith's brood, it's 200 years beyond the apocalypse. So it's beyond the horizon, but she's like, I can still understand what humans would do in these different conditions because of our patterns. Our patterns go back more than 200 years. We can learn, right? And so I, I'm, I'm always trying to engage people. And I'm like, I need you to at least try to look further. Most of us, especially in these, um, the conditions we're in right now, the longest we can actually see is about one electoral cycle, right? So we're like, you know, the way people respond, we're like, Biden won. And I was like, <laughs> it's gonna, that'll go so fast. What is long, what do we have to do during this time to change what happens next time? And how do we start to be thinking 50, 70, 80, 400 years ahead? Um, so, you know, I'm like, I'm like, there's a way that we can celebrate what we did. But when we look at the conditions, we always have to be like, and this is one step in a very long road. How can we extend our vision? And I said I was going to answer short and I did not. <laughs> so, but it was, a, it was such a compelling question. It's your fault, really, Damien. I hold you responsible. <laughs> uh, Troy. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am actually going to try to come on camera really quickly to ask my question. Okay. Um, I am stealing, I'm going to say boldly, stealing some time from my employer today to be in this space. So thank you all so much for holding this space for us and for inviting me. My question is, uh, let me get on the camera first. Hold on. Boom, there we go. Okay, I was all like, right. are you here and I don't see you? Oh, there you are. Hi, Sean. I am. Uh, hello. A uh, huge fan. I'm definitely I more know you. I'm a stan. So, I was like, you follow me on something. I follow you on everything. Okay. I was like, I yeah. know your day, Troy. <laughs> I'm that person. Um, Hi. Also, also, um, I'm one of the editors of Trouble the Waters, which is coming out. Oh, that's soon. what it, I was like. I know. Yeah. I'd like actually know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I have brought this conversation into my home. Uh, mm -hmm. And this question is actually from my wife, who's Good. a middle school educator. And she's eavesdropping right now. And she wants to know if you have resources or a finger to point in a direction about people who are thinking and talking boldly about kids' satisfaction in schools. Uh, mm -hmm. Schools are really fraught space right now. Uh, so who in the pleasure space might be centering how we use joy and irresistibility to hold accessible conversations with children about what they That's want okay. for school? Who I like this question. What's your wife's name? Kimberly, would you like to meet her? She is right yeah. here. Hi, Kimberly. That's a great question. Thank um, you for answering. So yeah, a couple of things jump to mind that I think will be useful. One is there's a podcast called the Raising Rebels pod that is this black mom and it's, she has like her kids are basically kind of driving the podcast and that she has a bunch of different guests who come on who are in, in the journey. They talk about consent. They're talking about the culture of what it is to be young in this time. And so Raising Rebels pod is excellent. Um, then there's a book called We Live for the We. Um, that my friend Danny McLean put out last year. I think that has a lot about what does it mean as a parent to be attuned to your child's satisfaction in a variety of different settings, right? We live for the we, yeah? And then there's a book called Parenting for Liberation, which is, there's a whole organization called Parenting for Liberation. She also has a blog. She's amazing. But she put out this beautiful book and it's it's telling stories, but it's really stories of like, how am I being in right relationship to what my children are going through experiencing in the world right now? So those are three things that pop to mind. There's also, um, I don't know if this quite fits, but there's this beautiful children's book called um, Julian is a Mermaid, Julian is a Mermaid, that is about this little child realizing that he's a mermaid and he wants to dress like a mermaid and, and do this whole beautiful thing. It's middle school, everything fits. Every, okay, like great, everything great. that is appropriate and kind to the children's hearts. Piece. Yeah, that's great. So it's, it's a, it, you know, it's a children's story, but I think it, it speaks a lot. And I think what the conversation could be is at what age did you start to know that there was something else you longed for? And how did the adults around you respond to that? Right. How did the adults around you respond to that? How would you have liked them to respond to that? What right now feels like this is something about me that is different. This is something about me that's unique. This is something that really wants to be expressed. And how do you want the adults around you to respond to that? And I think middle school is a great age to start getting kids to be like, I can, this is when you start to be able to organize your family 
right? This is as a unit, as a classroom, you start to be able to be like, we are demanding, we want our families to hear this, know this, we want to choose this play to do and those kind of things. So all of that, I think could be really cool, really exciting. And then I, I think that the parable of the sower, parable of the talents is a little rough uh, for middle school, but there's, I think there's a way to still tell some of the story because the protagonist is 15 um, when the story begins. And I think that's important. So I think there's, I often will, when I'm working with younger kids and I did this with my nibblings, I'll just tell them some of the story, right? It's like this person is living with her family. They live behind a wall because that's where they can be safe. And then the wall falls down and she has to know everything about how to survive. Now, if that happened to you, what would you do? Right? And right there, kids start to be like, oh, what do I know about survival? What do I need to know about survival? Our middle schoolers need to know, uh, have a go bag. They need to know these things right now. The climate is changing right now, right? They need to know. So I love this question. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, ASU. I really appreciate you all. Thank you for that excellent question. Uh, thank you all. And thank you, Adrian, uh, so yeah. much for, for being here. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I want to just do a quick thanks to all of our colleagues, all the other boats in the flotilla that came out to welcome Adrian's ship across the Zoom Sea, uh, Institute for Humanities Research, the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, the Faculty Women of Color Caucus. Uh, thanks to all of them for helping make this event happen. Thank you all for taking a little time out of your day to come and uh, play and imagine with us. So uh, it was great to see you all, old friends, new friends. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.